Hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. You will notice on entry to this Zoom meeting that you are muted and you will not have the option to unmute. We are, uh, we did that because we have a very large registration. We have more than 300 people and we want to make sure that this recording, which many other people wish to view, uh, has no accidental inter interruptions. So please um, understand and we encourage you to put anything you want to say in the chat box. We will do our best to address it there. Thank you so much. Well, I think it is now time to have Mr. William Colburn, the director of the Freer House, give us a welcome. Thanks, William. Thank you, Cheryl. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Cheryl mentioned, I'm the director of the historic Charles Lang Freer House uh, at the Merrill Palmer Scoven Institute here at Wayne State University, um, and sitting in the former Peacock Room of the Freer House uh, while broadcasting to you. So we are delighted to have attendees join us, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, from across the country, from Connecticut to DC, um, from California to Detroit. And despite the winter weather and the power outages affecting our region and other parts of the country, uh, do let us know where in the world you're joining us from. The Freer House is very honored and grateful to co-host tonight's program with our wonderful partners, the Friends of Asian Arts and Cultures at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And we wish to express our appreciation as well to our promotional co-sponsors uh, for Dr. Shin's lecture this evening, the University of Michigan Lieberthal Robel Center for Chinese Art and the Association of Chinese Americans. As uh, Cheryl mentioned, there will be a Q&A with Dr. Shen at the conclusion of his lecture, so please uh, do put your questions or comments in the chat function. Well, I first became acquainted with Dr. Shen's scholarship by reading his 2016 Columbia University PhD thesis and found it to be both a deeply researched and absolutely fascinating account that highlighted the role of key individuals like Charles Lang Freer in Detroit who contributed so much to raising awareness and appreciation of Chinese art in the United States and in the Midwest at the turn of the century progressive era. I then learned that Professor Shen had recently joined the faculty at the University of Michigan and contacted him asking if he would prepare a lecture for us and he kindly and generously agreed to do so. Um, and I spoke shortly after that with Catherine Kasdorf at the DIA who was equally enthused with the end scholarship and we quickly agreed to partner our organizations in hosting uh, his lecture tonight entitled Charles Lang Freer, Chinese Art and the Making of Global Detroit. And now I'll turn the program over to uh, Dr. Catherine Kasdorf, Associate Curator, Arts of Asia and the Islamic World at the Detroit Institute of Arts to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Catherine. Thank you so much, William, and thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. This is a really great turnout. Um, before I introduce Ian or Dr. Shin, I'd just like to say a few words about the DIA's Friends of Asian Arts and Cultures. Uh, so um, FAAC is a membership support group uh, that's committed to fostering an understanding and appreciation of the diverse cultures and artistic traditions of Asia, the Islamic world, and the ancient Middle East. Um, to learn more about the Friends of Asian Arts and Cultures um, or to join our group, um, I think there might be a link in the chat. If there's not, there, there should be pretty soon. Thank you. Um, there's a link in the chat or you can scan the QR code on the flyer. So one of many ways that the Friends of Asian Arts and Cultures supports the DIA is by sponsoring or co-sponsoring programs like this evening's lecture. Um, we also invite you to join us for our next program on April 4th, when Professor Margaret Graves of Indiana University will speak on ceramics in the Islamic world at the DIA, a history in fragments, that'll be in person. And on Sunday, March 5th, the DIA will celebrate Hina Matsuri, or Japanese Girls' Day, with a series of events that'll be open to the public, and there's more info about that on DIA.org. But to get to the point of this evening, uh, we are absolutely thrilled to collaborate with the Freer House once again and with our other co-sponsors to bring Dr. Yin Shin to speak on Charles Lang Freer, Chinese art, and the making of global Detroit. Dr. Shin 
is Assistant Professor of History and American Culture at the University of Michigan, and he teaches courses on the history of U.S. foreign relations and Asian Pacific Islander American studies. He has published widely in both academic and popular arenas, from the Journal of American East Asian Relations to the Detroit Free Press and Oxygen.com. And he's also contributed commentary and podcasts and other media outlets such as PBS NewsHour and many, among many others. In addition to his teaching, publishing, and public commentary, he also serves as vice president of the board of directors of the Association of Chinese Americans, a nonprofit organization that provides social services, cultural programming, and policy advocacy for the Asian American community of Southeast Michigan. And they're also a co-sponsor of tonight's lecture. As if all this were not enough, Dr. Shin is currently completing his first book entitled Imperial Stewards, Chinese Art and the Cultural Origins of America's Pacific Century. I, for one, am very much looking forward to reading it, and I'm delighted that we'll get something of a preview tonight. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Ian Shin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, um, for that very lovely introduction. Can everyone see the slides? I see a nod, so I will uh, hope that it is visible to uh, everybody. Um, I wanna just say uh, uh, first, uh, thank you again to um, my generous hosts for this evening's lecture, um, Catherine and William. It's been a dream to work with both of you uh, and to uh, bring the Fur House together with the DIA with U of M as a kind of tripartite partnership. I also wanna thank the folks who are working behind the scenes to bring this program together, especially given some of the logistical difficulties that we've had uh, with our weather patterns here in Michigan. Uh, Ryan Cunningham, Rose Foster, and Cheryl Deep, thank you to the three of you as well. And of course, thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your evening to join us. Um, I wish that we could all be together at uh, the beautiful Freer House uh, or at the DIA, uh, but Zoom will have to do for now. And one of the benefits of that is that we all get to be together, even though we have folks coming from, uh, you know, Connecticut and DC and Hawaii and California, uh, and of course, right here in Southeastern Michigan. So my topic for tonight uh, is Charles Lang Freer, Chinese art and the making of global Detroit. And the reason I chose this particular topic is to find a way to thread together three different things that sometimes are associated with different places. Charles Lang Freer, of course, uh, his name is on uh, the, the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, Chinese art speaks for itself, and then Detroit. How did these three things come together? And my argument tonight is that this history uh, gives us a fuller picture of the history of Detroit as a global city. As a colonial outpost, some of you may know that Detroit emerged at the nexus of Great Lakes indigenous peoples like the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi, as well as the British and French empires. In that sense, we might say that Detroit was perhaps always international, but not quite global. Now, writers that have traced the city's rise observed that it was largely a regional hub for commerce for most of the 1800s. So Scott Martell, for example, in his biography uh, of Detroit in the early 19th century, calls it a regional commercial center and a riverside city that was, quote, bu a bustling place. Even by the mid 1800s, however, he says that it was, quote, still at heart a small and agriculturally focused town. Similarly, architecture scholar Conrad Kickert calls Detroit during the 1800s, quote, a sleepy trade city bypassed by most of its peers. Now, many chroniclers of Detroit agree that what finally made the city global was the birth and growth of the auto industry in the early 20th century. And what better way to illustrate that than Charles Sheeler's painting of the River Rouge plant titled American Landscape, uh, which was painted in 1930. As Scott Bartell writes, auto manufacturing, quote, marked Detroit's maturation from its gawky adolescence as a regional economic center building railroad cars, stoves, and furniture to its future as a full-grown industrial global center. By the measure of its population as well, Detroit was also becoming global. So by 1920, half of the city's roughly 990,000 residents were immigrants that staffed its factories. They lived in neighborhoods with names like Greek Town and Germantown, which some of us still know very well today. 
But by focusing so closely on the economic and social life of Detroit, I wanna suggest that we miss something crucial about Detroit's globalization at the dawn of the 20th century, which is the role that culture and specifically Chinese art collecting played in putting the city into the minds of people all around the world and bringing them to Detroit. In fact, there is something very poetic about the way that Charles Freer, who helped drive Detroit's transformation into a Midwestern economic hub through his role in railroad cars manufacturing, and then helped to usher in the city's globalization as a cultural hub. I wanna note that this was not a predetermined outcome. It depended on a confluence of factors outside of Freer's control, and there were plenty of doubters along the way. These twists and turns make up the story that I wanna to tell tonight. Now, before I dive in, let me first introduce the central figure around which much of the history that I'll talk about this evening revolved. And that is Charles Lang Freer, whose picture you see on the screen. Born in 1854 in Kingston, New York, Freer moved to Detroit in 1879, and he made his fortune in railroad car manufacturing, a lucrative industry in the late 1800s when railroads literally carried the economic expansion of the United States. After he retired in 1899, Freer gave his full and undivided attention to art collecting, which is something he first began to do in the 1880s. Freer started with European American prints, before amassing one of the world's leading collection of works by the American painter, James McNeil Whistler. In the late 1880s, Freer began collecting Japanese artworks, including paintings, ceramics, and prints. And then in the mid 1900s, he added Middle Eastern ceramics to the mix. Freer's Chinese collection, which he started assembling as early as 1893, really hit its stride in the last decade of his life when China became his focus. I'm not gonna be discussing tonight very uh, specific artworks in very much detail, but it's important to note that Freer's Chinese art collection was exceptional during his lifetime for several reasons. So in ways that were different from other wealthier US collectors like JP Morgan and Henry Frick, who competed with each other, especially for expensive porcelains, Charles Freer blazed his own trail. He was the first American to seriously collect Chinese paintings, and he also built important collections of Neolithic jades, as well as Buddhist art from China. Other scholars like Daisy Wong and Kathleen Pine have explored the complex motivations behind Freer's collecting, including certainly aesthetic appreciation, but also spiritual enlightenment, financial strategies, and international relations. Under the influence of his advisor, Ernest Fenelosa, about whom I'm gonna say more later, Freer saw the three very sort of disparate branches of his collection, Japanese, Chinese, and American art as one harmonious whole. He stored a large part of uh, his art collection in his relatively modest, by Gilded Age standards, shingle style mansion at 33 Ferry Avenue East. And what I've given you here to look at is a map that charts not only uh, Charles Freer's home, which is, of course, the Freer house uh, that uh, William is the steward of, as well as a couple of the important museum institutions in Detroit's uh, turn of the century history. The Detroit Museum of Art, which was originally located down by the water at 704 East Jefferson Avenue, and then later on the Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, which is now on Woodward Avenue. Of course, the, the collection would not stay there permanently because in January 1905, as many of you may know, Charles Freer proposed to the Smithsonian that he would, after his death, donate his artworks along with funds to construct what was termed a suitable building to uh, house the collection if the US government would uh, maintain the collection and the building in perpetuity. President Teddy Roosevelt called Freer's proposal, quote, one of the most valuable collections which any private individual has ever given to any people. After the Smithsonian finally accepted the gift in 1906, Freer researched building designs, engaged an architect, and oversaw the drafting of the plans for the museum on the National Mall. And here on the screen, you see the, some of the plans uh, that Freer both drew on the back of, uh, of a notepad from the Plaza Hotel in New York, as well as the architect's sketch uh, of the building from 1915. Construction for what would become the Freer Gallery of Art began in 1916 in the middle of World War I, but Charles Freer sadly did not live to see its completion. He died in September 1919, just two years before the museum building was completed. Uh, 
And then on May 9th in 1923, the Freer Gallery of Art opened to the public. If you're keeping track of the math, you probably have realized that the Freer Gallery of Art, which is now part of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art, will celebrate its centennial this year. And I think it's vital to remember and to recognize the fact that the roots of that wonderful institution are here, right in our own backyard. So here is how I want to approach uh, my uh, topic this evening. Um, I, now that I've kind of introduced you to uh, Charles Freer and the a brief history of Detroit up to 1900, I'm going to start by talking about the prehistory of Chinese collections in Southeast Michigan and the institutions and collectors that in some ways sort of set the table for Freer and his collection. I think it's always important to acknowledge the context of a particular piece of history and to recognize that these phenomena, groundbreaking as they may seem to us, did not come out of nowhere. Second, I'll talk about the building and researching of Charles Freer's collection here in Detroit. I'm going to focus especially on the way that Freer's collection drew individuals from across the Pacific and the Atlantic to Detroit to admire and study that collection. Some of these visitors were leading curators and scholars of Asian art about whom we know quite a lot. Others of them were ordinary laborers who pass only briefly into and then out of view of historians, but both groups were important for the collection's development. Third, I'll talk about the ways that Charles Freer helped to cultivate awareness of and knowledge about Chinese art here in Detroit and in the surrounding areas, especially through lectures, kind of like the one that you are at tonight. And then finally, I'll end by reflecting briefly on how all of these various activities influenced Detroit's cultural reput reputation around the world. In other words, how Charles Lang Freer and Chinese art made Detroit global. So for us to think about and understand this history critically, I think it's important to recognize the context that preceded Charles Lang Freer. Everything has a past. Thanks to the initiative of enterprising university administrators and the generosity of local business leaders, Michiganders in Ann Arbor and Detroit actually had exposure to Chinese art beginning in the late 19th century, decades before Freer's collection became an international sensation. In 1885, the same year that Charles Freer and his business partner Frank Hecker set up their Peninsular Car Company in Detroit, the University of Michigan, where I now teach, received about 4,000 objects that had been part of the Chinese national exhibit at the World Cotton Centennial in New Orleans one year earlier. So here on the screen, you see a photograph of that collection now known as the Chinese Government Collection, which is now part of the university's uh, Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. Uh, and that is uh, still stored here today. And you see the wide variety of different objects that made up this collection. Um, it came to U of M evidently because, uh, in part, the Qing government did not wish to pay for the shipping costs that were necessary to return this massive exhibit back to China, and also because U of M's president at the time, James Angel, had an existing relationship with the Inspector General of the Chinese Maritime Customs Service that oversaw this exhibit. So this Chinese government collection ended up uh, in Ann Arbor. Um, it was shown in the university's galleries, um, and the collection really featured textiles. Um, textiles and cotton had been the, the theme of the New Orleans uh, Fair, um, as well as objects with decorative value like furniture and ceramics, including several vases and statuettes that were manufactured at the imperial kilns at Jingdezhen. And those of you who know the, the uh, uh, history of porcelain, of Chinese porcelain, uh, will remember that name, uh, Jingdezhen. Although these pieces were considered decorative rather than fine art, they nevertheless demonstrate how Michiganders were exposed to Chinese aesthetics around the same time that Freer's business career kicked into high gear. A few years after the University of Michigan received the Chinese government collection, the nascent Detroit Museum of Art, which is the predecessor of the DIA, received its first major Asian collection. That collection came from Frederick Stearns, whose uh, uh, wonderful uh, beard I, I admire very much because I can't grow facial hair to save uh, myself. Um, the donation came from Frederick Stearns, who was a druggist or a pharmacist uh, turned into a pharmaceutical manufacturer. Uh, and his collection included a really astounding array of objects from Japan, Korea, China, India, and Persia. It was a real boon to the Detroit Museum of Art, which was at that point only one or two years old. The Chinese portion of the Stearns collection included a lot of different things, ceramics, textiles and costumes, wood, jade and stone carvings, bronzes, lacquers, weapons, toys, 
paper products. You, you can go on and on about what he had collected while he was traveling overseas. When the museum honored Frederick Stearns with a medal in 1891, Stearns admitted that the purpose behind his travels and his collecting had been for self-education. So he explained, quote, I cannot say that my primary motive for making these collections was an unselfish hope of doing the public good. It was a rather strong desire to supplement my moderate early education and the experience gained by a close application to business for years, close quote. Whether Stearns was trying to downplay his wealth or not, what's clear is that Frederick Stearns's collection differed from Charles Freer's in at least three different ways. First, Stearns collecting uh, was encyclopedic and, not and, and it didn't distinguish between ethnological material and fine arts, nor did it include paintings, calligraphy, and other important categories of Chinese artistic production. Second, Frederick Stearns clearly favored Japan over China. And you can kind of see that focus when you see the, the big sumo wrestlers, uh, uh, models of which have been built as part of his collection and were put on display on the ground floor of the Detroit Museum of Art in the photo that you see on your screen. Third, and perhaps most significantly, Freer self-consciously shaped his art collection as an act of service to the nation. Nevertheless, I think Frederick Stearns can be said to have helped set the stage for Detroiter's knowledge of and encounters with Chinese art, including quite possibly for Charles Freer. By 1908, on the eve of Charles Freer's fourth trip to Asia and the first one to focus primarily on China, the Detroit Museum of Art possessed 1,600 samples of Chinese and Korean art alongside 430 unspecified quote unquote curiosities from Asia, the vast majority of these donated by Frederick Stearns. So if Frederick Stearns was, we might say, the opening act for Chinese art in Detroit, then we can think of Charles Lang Freer as the headliner. So let's turn our attention to thinking about the way that the Charles Freer's collection was built and researched in Detroit. Charles Freer's preeminence in the world of Chinese art certainly depended on all of the resources and talents that he brought to and cultivated in Detroit, but it also depended on the structural conditions that made Detroit fertile ground for cultural development from educational institutions like the University of Michigan that was nearby to the transportation and communication networks that linked the city and the region with other places in the United States and beyond. As Charles Freer's collection took shape, Curators, collectors, and dealers came to Detroit from around the country and the world to see its riches and some hoped to make a sale. Certain visitors uh, like Boston Museum of Fine Arts curator Ernest Fenelosa and Isaac T. Headland, who was a missionary and educator who spent 17 years in China, shared Freer's interest in Asian art through the time that they had spent in China, in Japan. They brought these experiences to Detroit in the years when Charles Freer was still coming into his own as an authoritative connoisseur and before he even had the opportunity himself to travel to China. I wanna talk about Isaac Hedlund's visit to Detroit. Um, Isaac Hedlund received Freer's invitation to visit Detroit after he returned to the United States in November of 1907 from China where he had assembled a collection of some 500 Chinese paintings. Hedlund began lecturing around the country on Chinese life, Chinese art, Chinese language, um, and he did so at summer conferences and Bible schools and colleges. And Freer was interested in meeting Hedlund because he had been under the impression that all of the best works of Chinese art, uh, especially painting, had been sold or taken to Japan. So if Hedlund's collection proved to be genuine, genuine then it would be sort of a game changer uh, that opened new avenues of collecting. After hearing about an exhibition and catalog of Hedlund's Chinese paintings that were exhibited in April of 1908, Charles Freer invited Hedlund to Detroit, quote, to make comparison of the two collections and determine whether or not the specimens in your collection would harmonize with those in my collection. To determine whether or not the specimens in your collection would harmonize with those in my collection was, of course, a very polite way of saying that they would figure out which, if any, of Hedlund's paintings Freer might buy for himself. The two ended up settling on September 28th, as the date for Hedlund to travel from his home near Pittsburgh to Detroit. And as it turns out, there were indeed specimens that Hedlund brought along that harmonized very well with Freer's collection. Freer ended up purchasing two paintings from Hedlund that are still in the collection of the National Museum of Asian Art. The first is a 17th century hand scroll titled The Peach Festival of the Queen Mother of the West. And the second was an older 12th century hanging scroll titled Pavilion of Rising Clouds, which you see on the screen next to a portrait of Isaac Hedlund. 
Breer was especially taken with the Peach Festival hand scroll. He wrote to Hedlund after Hedlund left, quote, each time I have seen the makimono purchased from you, I have found additional beauty. It will, I am sure, be the means of giving me much pleasure for a long time to come. Although that hand scroll is little studied today, the Pavilion of Rising Clouds, which you see on your screen, is still considered to be an important painting based on the large-scale compositions of the song artist Mi Fu. There were other visitors too, who came from much farther distances to Detroit from Europe and Asia. Gaston Migion's visit in 1906 is a particularly good example of how Charles Freer's collection helped to promote Detroit into the circuit of cultural hubs in the early 20th century United States. The 45-year-old Gaston Mijon arrived in New York from Paris on August 18, 1906, on the way to a six-month residency in Japan. Mijon was, at that point, uh, a curator at the Louvre uh, Museum in Paris. Um, he was officially appointed in the medieval and Renaissance art departments, uh, but he had great intellectual range and he embraced Asian and Islamic arts as well. The Detroit Free Press, when they met him, called him, quote, one of the most eminent French authorities on Oriental art. Mijon and Freer had corresponded before his arrival in the United States, and Freer actually helped to shape Mijon's itinerary by leading him to some U.S. cities while steering him away from others, in effect creating a, a sort of geography of taste and distinction. Mijon ultimately visited New York, Boston, Montreal, Detroit, and Chicago, and following Freer's advice, he bypassed Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. Freer's choice of cities for Mijon helps to reveal how he wanted to frame uh, Mijon's view of the burgeoning Chinese art scene in the United States in a way that de-emphasized the kind of genteel Gilded Age porcelain collecting that was popular in the late 19th century, and instead direct Mijon's attention towards what Freer considered to be broader and more sophisticated collection that featured other mediums, especially painting. Boston was a very important stop because in Freer's estimation, it was, quote, the most important collection of Chinese and Japanese art in America. Freer joined Mijon actually at the MFA in Boston, which turned out to be as much of a revelation for him as it had been for Mijon, because Freer had not seen many of the MFA's Chinese and Japanese paintings. In New York City, Freer recommended the collections of a couple of private individuals, Henry Havemeyer and Howard Mansfield, but he actually warned that the Metropolitan Museum of Art, quote, has very few important oriental objects outside of J.P. Morgan's porcelains. And of course, Mijon would stop in Detroit, as I said, to see Freer's own collection on Ferry Avenue, where they were joined by, the, uh, by Ernest Fenelosa, uh, a curator from the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Mijon had a very enthusiastic reaction to these collections around the United States, and it signals the way that these American collections were starting to achieve uh, a favorable standing in the eyes of an internationally renowned figure in the Chinese art world, with Detroit right there in the middle of the mix. Mijon told the Detroit Free Press that he was, quote, much interested and often surprised to see to what extent this country is ahead of Europe in the acquisition of oriental objects of art. He said that New York and Boston collections contain masterpieces that cannot be surpassed. Notably, Mijon gushed about, quote, this wonderful, this astonishing, this magnificent collection of Mr. Freer's in Detroit, saying that he had never, quote, seen so fine a collection of its kind. The chance also to meet Ernest Fenelosa from Boston was especially precious to Mijon. In his preface to the French translation of Fenelosa's book, Epochs of Chinese and Japanese Art, Mijon later wrote that, quote, it was an unforgettable week of long talks where in front of the works, I was able to judge the extent of Fenelosa's knowledge, the sureness of his taste, the vividness and the acuity of his impressions. So under Freer's watchful eye as a convener, Detroit became sort of a crossroads for those from different corners of the expanding Chinese art world to meet each other and to advance their own knowledge. Now, we've talked about some of the higher profile visitors to Detroit to visit Charles Freer's collection. The globalization of Detroit through Chinese art collecting and scholarship also proceeded behind the scenes in ways that were less likely to yield a gushing news story in the Detroit Free Press. In 
So Charles Freer's work on his Chinese art collection depended especially on Chinese students who were studying at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, whose knowledge and whose labor actually helped make the Detroit collection a hub of global connections in the early decades of the 20th century. So on the screen, you see a photo of the Michigan Chinese Club, a club for Chinese students studying at U of M. This is uh, uh, from the Michigan yearbook. Uh, and it's the club from 1913. Uh, and, and there were photos uh, from, of, of the Chinese Students Club uh, uh, for, for many of the years uh, in, in the early 1900s. Um, Chinese students played a very specific role in the life of Freer's collection. Um, in order to understand the seals and the inscriptions that featured so prominently on many artworks, and in an era before the study of Chinese language in the United States was widespread, Freer needed to recruit several native Chinese to work on his collection. Um, Freer faced two challenges in this regard. First, like most Western collectors of his generation, Freer did not speak Chinese or write Chinese, uh, which uh, prevented him from being able to kind of penetrate into the deeper literary meanings uh, of his collection without help. Second, Freer must have also recognized that living in Detroit, away from major centers of the Chinese population in the United States in the early 1900s, he would face some difficulty in engaging local translators who might be able to work with some of these archaic scripts. So Freer's solution to overcoming this hurdle was very clever. He exploited an exemption in US immigration laws that otherwise prohibited Chinese people from entering the country between 1882 and 1943. So, and, and that was, of course, the Chinese Exclusion Act um, and the, the different acts that uh, codified exclusion in the aftermath of 1882. In fact, in the 19 teens, the University of Michigan was one of the largest destinations for foreign study Chinese students in the United States, giving for a significant local talent pool from which to draw his translators. According to club reports in the Chinese Students Monthly, the Chinese student population at U of M increased from seven students in June of 1911 to 53 by January of 1912. The Chinese Student Alliance uh, chapter in Ann Arbor boasted that it was, quote, about the largest Chinese student body that can be found at any one university in the United States. This number increased to 59 by November of 1912 and reached 73 members by June of 1913. Again, you see some of them standing and sitting uh, in that group portrait uh, on your screen. As early as 1910, Charles Freer began to contact these Chinese students. Um, he engaged a revolving door of them in the years that followed, uh, sometimes even turning to diplomatic contacts in Washington, DC to help him recruit translators. The first student to answer his call was a student named Chen Wei Chung, who came to Ann Arbor from Beijing and received his doctorate at U of M after completing a dissertation on the educational work of missionaries in China. Um, Chen's help, however, proved to be rather short-lived. And by 1911, uh, May of 1911, Freer once again was uh, looking for another Chinese translator. And the next student to sign on was a student named T.S. Ma, who was a student at Columbia University, who evidently traveled all the way to Detroit from New York City to work on Freer's collection. Freer was uh, a great admirer of Ma's work, even though, again, it was a very short partnership. Um, when Ma returned to China in the fall of 1911 to assist with the Republican Revolution under Sun Yat-sen's leadership, Freer actually tried to track him down through connections at Columbia. And he wrote to a colleague at Columbia that Ma was, quote, very competent and quite able to translate both inscriptions and seals and took copies of many, agreeing to furnish complete translation not later than the middle of December. But, and this is where it's interesting, Freer says, I can quite understand that his patriotism caused him to drop everything and devote his time and efforts to bringing about a Republican form of government in China. There was very little that Freer could do uh, about the nationalist uh, patriotic feelings of his Chinese collaborators. Freer's interactions with subsequent Chinese translators, all of them Chinese foreign study students, show that this very headstrong collector could also exhibit deference and courtesy to individuals whose assistance he required. So after T.S. Ma, Freer's third helper was a Chinese student named Wee, who began working for Charles Freer around August of 1913. This was possibly, from what I can tell, uh, Roland Tingxing Wee, who was from Zhaoyong, who was uh, auditor of the Chinese Students Club at the University of Michigan. We recruited evidently a second student named Chen to accompany him to Freer's house on Prairie Avenue in Detroit. Um, but yet again, the partnership lasted less than a year. Um, there's no evidence that Chen Wei Chung or RT Wee were for some reason, you know, voting with their feet 
Um, but their withdrawals from this work make clear that these Chinese students did not really feel bound at all to Charles Freer. Uh, and this turnover caused Charles Freer some measure of anxiety because it disrupted the important research that he knew he could not carry out on his own. Charles Freer's most productive relationship with a translator began around 1914 with a University of Michigan student named D.K. Liu. And here we actually are fortunate to be able to find D.K. Liu in the photograph from the Michigan yearbook and to be able to highlight him uh, for you tonight. Um, Freer, um, uh, over the course of his partnership with D.K. Liu, commended Liu to several of his curator and dealer friends. Um, Freer's letter of introduction of D.K. Liu uh, to Bertolt Laufer, who was a distinguished sinologist at the Field Museum in Chicago, for example, reveals the kind of affection and respect that Freer felt for D.K. Liu. Um, Freer explained that, quote, Mr. Liu has very kindly made many translations of the inscriptions on the Chinese art objects in my collection, and I feel deeply obligated to him. In a pretty remarkable gesture, Freer actually made clear to Laufer that Laufer ought to treat this Chinese student as Laufer would treat him. He said, quote, any courtesies that you may extend to Mr. Liu will be considered as personal by me. The reason why Freer held D.K. Liu in such high esteem is because Liu was more than just a translator. He regarded Liu as a co-intellectual really in the field of Chinese art. And like some of his predecessors, D.K. Liu made lasting contributions to Freer's understanding of Chinese art. Uh, and even years after Liu returned to China, Freer would write to him and tell him about how some of the translations that he had done uh, had been so impactful and that they were still using and relying on those translations uh, years after D.K. Liu's return to China to teach at uh, Tsinghua College, now Tsinghua University. So as we take a step back and think about everyone who came to Detroit as part of building and researching this collection, we can see that the growth and development of Freer's collection in Detroit also benefit in, uh, benefited in part from its proximity to an institution that had become a big part of the overseas Chinese world, and that, of course, is U of M. Charles Freer's relationship with these Chinese translators that he appointed during the 19-teens uh, were very different depending on the level of skill that each person brought to this work. But despite their different levels of contributions, what unified these students was their knowledge of the Chinese language that even if only for a short time made each of them a vital partner in the intellectual project of interpreting Chinese culture in the United States. What I'm still not very clear about is why they helped Freer. The correspondence between Freer and his students suggests that many of them weren't really paid for the work that they performed, possibly um, as the way that Freer vouched for D.K. Liu to Bertolt Laufer would suggest, um, what these Chinese students gained from associating with a wealthy American collector was a form of social capital rather than financial capital. Uh, but uh, it's still, uh, to me, a, a question um, as to uh, why some of these uh, Chinese students so enthusiastically uh, 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 came to Detroit and, and worked, uh, it seems really hard, uh, on Charles Freer's collection. Uh, and it may be that they uh, simply shared his love uh, of Chinese art. So to Charles Freer, shaping Detroit into a globally aware and cosmopolitan city meant not, meant not only building a collection that would draw collectors and experts from all over the world, but also facilitating the education of the city's residents about Chinese and Asian art. This work proved to be quite challenging and occasionally even very dispiriting. In 1914, the poet and critic Sadakichi Hartman published a punishing assessment of the art scene in Detroit. He wrote, quote, imagine a city with 600,000 inhabitants without an art club, without any art store of metropolitan importance, with no special attractions, but the poster display on Woodward Avenue and such glyptic atrocities as the Cadillac chair and the Schiller and Columbus monuments. Detroit, he noted, had an art museum, but Sadakichi Hartman questioned its worth. He called the museum trustees, quote, men of the dilettante type. He said, they are harmless, no doubt well-meaning men who are eminently fit to manage a seed warehouse, department store, or bank, but an art museum cannot be run on such principles. Harmon very likely knew, or at least knew of, Charles Freer because of his own writings about Japanese art and because he wrote about the painter James McNeil Whistler, and he recognized Freer as one of the main pillars of Detroit's art scene alongside that museum, the art schools, and the city's beautification commission. Even so, Hartman deemed Freer, quote, a man of taste 
but hardly a man of judgment. For example, Hartman noted that Freer had, quote, accumulated some wonderful specimens of Asian ceramics, but he questioned why Freer patronized Mary Chase Perry and her Powabic pottery studio, which he considered, quote, all surface embellishment and really no pottery at all. Those of us who love Powabic uh, might take great offense uh, to, to Hartman's characterization, but uh, such as it is. Uh, ultimately, Sarakichi Hartman asked if Powabic, story, uh, pottery, Powabic pottery was actually not, quote, emblematical of Detroit uh, art, all for show on the surface and not baked sufficiently. Harsh words uh, indeed. So how do we make sense of such a harsh assessment of Detroit's art scene at the dawn of the 20th century and also of Charles Freer? Hartman was not a native or a resident of Detroit. He had been born in Nagasaki uh, and he traveled between the United States and Europe and was really more used to covering the bohemian and modernist scenes in New York City. In this particular article, he was, I think, speaking less against the city and more on behalf of local artists whose views uh, and attempts to interest Detroiters in aesthetic matters, Hartman felt, were being overridden by what he called, quote, rich amateurs who really do not know what they want. In other words, this was less a critique of taste or the lack thereof in Detroit and more of the way that wealth and power restricted creative expression. Nevertheless, if we feel tempted to dismiss these criticisms as the mere musings of a coastal elitist, uh, I think we also have to acknowledge that some Michiganders shared uh, Sadakichi Hartman's opinions. So as late as 1922, for example, the Bay City-born novelist and Detroit News reporter Leonard Klein deemed Detroit to be a city of, quote, salesmen and mechanics. He believed that even its newly created cultural district in Midtown, made up of the Detroit Public Library and the planned DIA, was at best, quote, the outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual salesmanship. Klein continued to write damningly that these couple of buildings were, quote, a gesture like the carnation on Mother's Day in the buttonhole of a man who has not written home in 12 years. Three years before, Klein had given a talk at the Detroit English Club entitled Detroit's Future as an Art Center. And we can imagine that Sadakichi Hartman, if he had been able to attend that evening, nodding vigorously at what Klein had to say. Why is it important for us to know about these conversations about Detroit's art scene in the early 20th century? Because I think they give us a better sense of the task before Charles Freer as he tried to stimulate interest in and knowledge about Chinese art in Detroit. Despite naysayers like Sadakichi Hartman and Leonard Klein, Charles Freer worked diligently for nearly two decades to bring about Detroit's future as an art center. Freer began organizing Asian art lectures in Detroit as early as 1901 when he arranged three talks by the curator and scholar Ernest Fenelosa. Again, Fenelosa was a key advisor to uh, Freer uh, in the last decade of Fenelosa's life up to 1908. In some ways, his early efforts at uh, uh, organizing a lecture by Fenelosa led Charles Freer to the same discouraging conclusions as Sarkichi Hartman and Leonard Klein. In taking stock of how other similar lectures had been received in Detroit, Freer informed Fenelosa's agent in New York that, quote, we, meaning he and Detroit Museum of Art Director A.H. Griffith, fear that the peoples of our city would fail to rise as they should to either of Professor Fenelosa's courses of lectures. Instead, Freer and Griffith proposed that Fenelosa deliver three different lectures at the Detroit Museum of Art, a lecture for $100 on a comparison of European and Asiatic art, a second lecture on Japanese and Chinese poetry, and a third lecture on problems in art education. Explaining the situation to Fenelosa after the lecture program had finally been set, Freer admitted that, quote, Detroit at best is a very poor lecture town. I beg to differ based on uh, our attendance tonight, uh, but certainly things have changed. He went on to say, personally, you know very well that I would be delighted to hear all that you have to say on the topics mentioned in your catalog, and perhaps there are half a dozen others in Detroit of the same mind. But he regretted that, quote, the total number would be exceedingly small. So I think we can see here a little bit how Freer was constructing his identity as a collector and connoisseur in contrast to what he felt was the sort of crass industrial character of the city that he at that point called home. Fenelosa's appearance at the Detroit Museum of Art in 1901 actually became the first of many more appearances, which signaled the city's rapidly growing interest in Asian art. This Bostonian curator uh, visited Detroit essentially every year until his death in 1908. And many of these visits included a lecture by Fenelosa, who spoke at venues like the Art Museum, Church of Our Father, which overlooked Grand Circus Park, and the University Club, which was then located near Campus Martius. In these talks, Fenelosa counseled his audience to adopt 
a more dynamic view of Chinese art. So in his 1906 address at the University Club, for example, Fenelosa contested what he considered to be two common misconceptions of ancient Chinese art, that it was static and unchanging, and that China was, quote, cut off from the rest of the world and remained without foreign influence. In fact, Fenelosa informed his listeners, Chinese art had undergone, quote, constant change and progress, and the country had been shaped through its interactions with a whole host of other cultures. Fenelosa's ideas are, in fact, in principle, if not in specifics, still endorsed by modern day Chinese art historians. So for example, as Michael Sullivan has written of Chinese art during the Tang Dynasty, the art of this period is as full of imported motifs as were the streets of Chang'an with foreigners. By 1909, when British museum curator Lawrence Binion inquired about touring the United States in the not too distant future and stopping in Detroit to give tours, to, to give lectures, Charles Freer could say confidently to him that, quote, interest is much deeper and wider on this side, quote, and that he could assure a thoroughly satisfactory engagement for the English curator. Freer actually acknowledged that Fenelosa's first attempt to arouse the city's interest in Asian art had been disappointing, but he observed that, as we have seen, Fenelosa, quote, succeeded very well after his first year. So he invited Binion and his wife to come stay with him for a week, uh, and that visit finally came to fruition in 1912. Here we have uh, Lawrence Binion looking uh, ever uh, the part of a poet, um, speaking at the art museum under the auspices of the Society of Arts and Crafts. Lawrence Binion paid homage to Freer and promoted Detroit in the same glowing terms that Gaston Mijon had used six years before. Binion called Detroit, quote, particularly fortunate because as he said unequivocally, quote, I consider Mr. Freer's collection of Chinese paintings the best or the finest, excuse me, in the world, close quote. With the benefit of Freer's good taste, Binion hinted that the cultural sophistication of Detroiters outpaced perhaps even that of art experts in England, who he said had been very surprised by the quality of Chinese paintings at an exhibition that Binion had organized in England several years before. We know that Binion was not simply buttering up Chinese Charles Freer in his hometown newspaper because he described Freer in Detroit in similar terms to others aside from the Detroit Free Press. The location of the University of Michigan in nearby Ann Arbor again helped to bolster the attractiveness of Detroit as a cultural hub, although sometimes uh, I, I want to note that the college town actually managed to outshine uh, the bigger city to its east. So in 1914, the Chinese art expert John C. Ferguson and his wife Mary spent several days visiting with Freer and learning about his collection in Detroit. Here you see uh, Ferguson uh, in a, a portrait by William Merritt Chase. Uh, Ferguson uh, was a missionary who had spent many decades in China as a government official and became a well-respected collector um, and Chinese art expert. As part of his visit to Michigan, Ferguson also gave a series of three lectures, two in Ann Arbor and one in Detroit. In Ann Arbor, Ferguson was hosted by University President Harry Hutchins. Uh, he also met with Chinese students at the request and also with U of M faculty. In Ann Arbor, Ferguson spoke first about the political turmoil in China, followed by a second lecture on Chinese art that was, according to his wife Mary, quote, even better than the first. Back in Detroit, Ferguson delivered one final lecture entitled The Spirit of Chinese Art at the Detroit Museum of Art. Reflecting on Ferguson's presentation, the museum's bulletin praised it as being, quote, of great value to his audience, close quote, for he built a historical and philosophical background against which the various phases of art in China were placed and properly appreciated. Mary Ferguson, interestingly, saw things a little bit differently. She reported to her daughter, Florence, that Ferguson's lecture at the muse art museum was, quote, good and well received, though the audience could not compare with that of Ann Arbor in intelligent interest in the subject. Charles Freer's investment in educating the public about Chinese art extended well beyond uh, organizing and presenting public talks during his lifetime. At the end of his life, Charles Freer gave $50,000 to the University of Michigan in the form of 435 shares of Park Davis stock, which he stipulated, quote, shall be used to add to the knowledge and appreciation of Oriental art. Later designated as the Freer Research and Publication Fund, this money uh, was formalizing the, uh, formalized the relationship between the, uh, the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Uh, and Southeastern Michigan by providing funds for experts to conduct research on and to publish about objects in the Freer Gallery's collection. One of the first Freer Fellows was Benjamin March, uh, the gentleman on the far left of your screen. 
Benjamin March had been appointed curator of Asian art at the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1927, and he maintained a connection with the museum in Detroit um, even after he was appointed a curator and lecturer of Far Eastern art at U of M later on in the 1930s. Another Freer fellow, Harold P. Stern, whose picture is in the middle, was a native Detroiter and a historian of Japanese art who later became the third director of the Freer Gallery of Art. The terms of the Freer Fund were revised in 1948 to explicitly support the publication of or Ars Orientalis, that, which to this day is a leading journal on Asian and Middle Eastern art history as a joint project between the Freer Gallery of Art and the University of Michigan. So in all of these ways, Charles Freer's spirit of curiosity and learning continues to live on in Michigan. So how, if at all, did this activity transform Detroit's reputation around the world? While there are no public opinion polls for us to draw from to give us a gauge of this transformation, certainly among serious collectors and curators, Detroit became synonymous with Charles Freer as an important center for the collecting and study of Chinese art. In 1912, Freer sent a selection of objects to what was then known as the Smithsonian's National Museum. Um, the, the photo that you see on the screen of the building uh, is the building in which that, uh, um, those objects were exhibited. Um, he sent that selection of objects uh, for an exhibition that prominently featured the Asian portion uh, of his collection. The selection that was placed on display featured 26 Chinese artists, all of them from the Tong, uh, Tong and Song dynasties, uh, and six Japanese artists. Um, the exhibition was a resounding critical success. Uh, a leading German art magazine called Freer's collection, which it noted was based in Detroit, quote, one of the greatest of East Asian art in the world. The show's positive reception delighted Detroiters who were proud to see their city's profile elevated across the Atlantic in connection with Freer's reputation. The Detroit Free Press boasted, and you see the headline from that article, as the home of the great collector Charles L. Freer, who is generally regarded by authorities as the great living expert of Oriental art, and as the home of the marvelous collection whose fame is worldwide, Detroit comes in for a goodly share of reflected glory. Detroit rode on Charles Freer's coattails, even as Freer became increasingly disenchanted with the city's industrialization. As his biographer Helen Tomlinson, who I think is maybe on this call tonight, um, as she notes, since 1907, Freer had spent barely half of his time in the city. He would come to Detroit, he would come to describe Detroit as, quote, busy, smoky, seething town, and to say that, quote, it has lost nearly all of its charm. It would be fair to wonder, perhaps, if Charles Freer gave more to Detroit, or if Detroit gave more to Charles Freer. Now, what is the history of Charles Lang Freer's collection of Chinese art tell us about the globalization of Detroit in the early 20th century. What I've shared with you tonight affirms what historian Kristen Hoganson has written recently about the international, global, and imperial past of the Midwest, which is often seen in her words as, quote, static and inward looking, the quintessential home reference by homeland security, the steadfast stronghold of the nation in an age of mobility and connectedness, the crucible of resistance to the global, the America of America first. Those of us who call the Midwest and more specifically Southeastern Michigan home will quickly point out that this is not the case, but perhaps even we are less familiar with the important role that culture played at the turn of the 20th century in marking Detroit's place on the world map. Specifically, Charles Freer's art networks reaching across the Atlantic and Pacific oceans brought collectors, curators, and students flocking to the city and invoking its name with respect. At a time when US policymakers were awakening to Asia and the Pacific as regions that were vital for the interests of the United States, Detroit, as much as Boston and New York, and more so arguably than many cities on the West Coast at the time, became a crucial point of connection for understanding the art and the culture of this part of the world. Today, the Freer House, the Detroit Institute of Arts and others carry on this rich legacy, a legacy that really benefits us all. Thanks very much. I look forward to your comments and to your questions. Thank you so much, Ian. What a wonderful lecture. I was furiously taking notes the entire time and I filled up a few pages in my little notebook here. Um, we already have some questions, but um, if I may, I'd like to, to take the privilege of uh, asking you the first one. Um, I was 
I was especially interested in learning more about the Chinese students from U of M that worked with Freer. And I know that you're still researching and thinking through that and puzzling over some of their motivations and everything. But um, I was wondering, do we know what they studied, what what degrees they uh, received from U of M. Um, I know you, you mentioned DK Lu went on to teach at a university. Um, so I was just wondering, was was their work with Freer part of professional training for them? Or was it like a side gig that they did while they were finishing their degrees? That's a great question. And, you know, one of my great disappointments in researching this topic has been that I've still not been able to find, despite my best efforts, the, the records of these students, which the university assiduously keeps uh, at, at the Bentley Historical Library. Um, we know generally a couple of things about the character uh, of uh, Chinese students who came to the United States to study at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, most of them studied what would be called kind of practical fields rather than liberal arts fields. They were like many of my students today, worried about employability, but really they were what they were thinking about was the way that they would be able to use their education to advance what they considered the modernization of their country. Um, and so most of them studied things like economics and economics and politics and law um, in, in hopes of being able to take those ideas back to China um, as China became uh, you know, a republic uh, and uh, to kind of rebuild the government in the aftermath of the collapse of the Qing dynasty. Uh, and so that was kind of the, 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 the general uh, character and nature of overseas Chinese student education. Um, we, we do know that a lot of these students um, seem to have had uh, either came from elite backgrounds, uh, which was true of many overseas students from different countries that come, came to the United States to study, often from kind of high ranking, maybe literati families. Uh, so they had maybe grown up with uh, an interest in uh, and an experience around Chinese art objects. Uh, and so maybe based on those interests and their family backgrounds and personal backgrounds, you know, had an interest in working with uh, and for freer in translating some of these uh, inscriptions and colophons and whatnot. Uh, but it, it doesn't seem to have been a major part of their professional work as well, uh, based on what I've been able to tell, um, but that they, they sort of did it as part of their own kind of personal passions in the field. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, and I'll just <clears throat> remind everyone that um, you're muted, but you can drop questions in the chat. And if you wish to, you can turn on your cameras so we can feel like we're all in a room together chatting. Um, I do see some questions, but first I wanna ask William if um, you want to ask a question before we move to the, the chat box. Thank you, Catherine. I'm glad you expounded upon the uh, Chinese students that uh, Ian has discovered uh, that contributed so much. I think it's a fascinating discovery and, and thank you so much for sharing that research with us. Um, I, I did want to point out, I mean, you, you show how the press covered Freer so extensively, especially here in Detroit. And there's a lot of buried treasure, so to speak, in those articles. Um, but one of them in particular that I think is very much worth noting uh, in 1911, after Freer returned from his largest, uh, longest trip to China, um, he spoke out in the press very strongly against uh, the United States enforcement of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, and in fact, in one article, he did it two times uh, at the beginning and at the end of his interview. And I think it's quite extraordinary to think of anyone who had connections in Washington was dependent on Congress at the time of you know, actually constructing and building his museum to go to the press speaking out to which few people did uh, against the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I, I would hope that might be some sympathy with the students who are also uh, working so closely with him. Yeah, I totally agree. And thanks for bringing that up, William, you know, especially in, in uh, with regards to the way that Chinese students were able to kind of skirt around the edges of the exclusion laws because there was an exemption made for certain classes of Chinese people that still entered the United States after 1882. Um, what, you know, one of the things that Charles Greer said, and you and I have had, you know, many wonderful conversations about this, um, that, that, you know, Freer felt like he had been treated very well by Chinese of all different classes that he had met, uh, you know, not just the kind of hoity-toity elite kind of connoisseurs and collectors that he had been, you know, treated to, to, to seeing the collections of, but also, you know, the, the kind of everyday laborer who worked with and for him uh, on his expeditions to China. And he said, without a fault, all of them had been courteous to me. Uh, and I see no reason why, you know, we would discriminate against, uh, you know, the, this this uh, nation of peoples. Uh, and, and I think that that is, an interesting, um, to me as a historian of immigration as well, because oftentimes you see people drawing distinctions based on class in terms of who they think 
you know, would be uh, the, the, you know, kind of, uh, 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 you know, appropriate to admit to the United States. And, and the exemption for Chinese students uh, within the Chinese exclusion laws is one very good example of that, that kind of high class merchants or tourists or uh, teachers and students were allowed to enter the United States, but ordinary laborers were not. And Charles Burke clearly felt uh, a sense of gratitude for and connection to uh, the ordinary Chinese who worked for him, as well as the, the very elite uh, Chinese collectors and connoisseurs that he, uh, you know, socialized with. Wonderful points. And they kind of um, segue into a few of the questions and comments in the chat. So Charles Silver says, how much of the growth in Chinese students at U of M was due to the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship Program? And he followed up saying he thinks one of the largest contingents of the Boxer Indemnity students went to MIT. Um, and then Michael Quick says, as you mentioned, the Chinese students entered our country as a special exception to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so um, maybe talk a little bit more about those, that group of comments. Sure, yeah. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, the Boxer Indemnity uh, Fund was a, a pot of money that the United States essentially uh, quote unquote returned to China. Um, there was uh, in, in 1900, there was an uprising called the Boxer Uprising uh, that uh, threatened a lot of foreigners uh, in China, uh, a lot of kind of political instability on the ground, essentially. Uh, and uh, ultimately, what happened was that uh, a number of different Western countries came together to crush the rebellion um, and, and then uh, forced China to pay uh, an indemnity for the damages that had been caused uh, as part of that uprising. Um, the United States soon sort of realized uh, that it didn't need any of this money and as a gesture of its goodwill um, and, and as a very strategic play in terms of showing uh, its uh, uh, essentially benevolence towards China would return some of that money explicitly for the education uh, of Chinese students in the United States. I mean, and, and you can, you know, sort of see again that this, you know, is in some ways a very generous gesture. It's also something that would reap reward, uh, reap benefits for the United States. If you bring Chinese students to the United States, you kind of, you know, inculcate them in kind of American culture and American ways of thinking, and then you send them back to China uh, and, and build an ever tighter, closer relationship uh, between China and the United States. Um, so there were a number of students who came to uh, U of M as a result uh, of the Boxer Indemnity uh, Scholarship. I don't know exactly how many, uh, but I also do know that there were a number of other folks active at U of M uh, who tried to establish closer educational ties with China. So for example, uh, a program that we still have at U of M is called the Barber Scholarship. Um, and the Barber Scholarship was created to fund the education of Chinese women specifically, um, and has been bringing women uh, from Asia, I think not just China, but uh, more broadly, uh, uh, you know, to, to U of M to study since the early 1900s. So there was a, a, a great movement at the time uh, to promote educational ties between the United States and China. Great, and just another follow-up in the chat from Michael Quick, um, just continuing what he was writing before as an exception to the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese students may have entered the US based on agreeing not to work and it might've been impossible for fair to pay them. Um, so do you care to comment more on that or? Yeah, that's it's it's a great it's a great thought. I um I, I think you know that that's certainly my understanding of international students these days uh, that they uh, are allowed to work up to a certain amount of hours and uh, beyond that they are asked not to work uh, because they are primarily here for educational purposes. You know, as a historian, what I would wonder about is when that regulation comes to be the case. Uh, when do we start thinking about foreign students as primarily here to uh, be educated rather than to work? And I don't know if that was part of the, I don't believe that that was part of the stipulation of the exemption uh, as part of the Chinese Exclusion Act, but it may have been, uh, you know, uh, part of the, the students kind of own understanding of wanting to make sure that they're seen as students and not as laborers or not as being employed, uh, which would disqualify them uh, from, uh, from staying in the United States. So that's a certainly a possibility. So thank you for pointing that out. Sure. Yeah, and then uh, somebody named E.K. has a comment that it would be interesting to, to say a bit more about how Freer collected his Chinese collections. Um, you made reference to some trips to China, so, and um, he left pictures and notes as E.K. notes. Do you, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah, and I, I'd invite William to chime in as well. Um, this is, you know, a, a topic that other speakers have covered uh, really love in really lovely ways uh, at other meetings uh, uh, of the Freer House uh, and other lectures. Um, uh, you know, Freer 
uh, was one of the first kind of uh, real serious American collectors to travel to China um, and uh, made several visits um, that where he, he kind of penetrated deep into the country and, and was able to see things uh, and make connections that others had not been able to do. Um, you know, the, the visit from Hedlund uh, that I talked about in 1906 uh, uh, or, or 1908 was really key in kind of reorienting his attention towards China to sort of say there are still things there to be collected uh, and led him to, to those visits. Um, he also welcomed uh, a large number of dealers whom I didn't really talk about tonight uh, to Detroit uh, who, who uh, brought you know paintings and, and other artworks for him to consider buying. Uh, and so uh, you know he corresponded with them uh, and he, he uh, visited their, their rooms uh, in New New York when he was there. Um, so there were lots of different ways in which, um, uh, you know, Freer would, uh, would, would assemble his collection, uh, you know, both in terms of making purchases uh, while he was in China, uh, but also entertaining dealers uh, here in the United States, uh, in, including in Detroit. I don't know if maybe William, you want to add uh, a little bit more to what I've said. I, there's, there's, there's a whole kind of separate lecture that could be given about how Freer put his collections together. Well, yeah, I think uh, both of us would acknowledge there's, there's many other people. One name comes to mind, Daisy Yu Wang, who could probably expound on this much more. And of course, uh, curators at the, at the Freer Gallery, National Museum of Asian Art themselves. Um, but I think part of it, you know, stemmed initially just practic practically in the sense that uh, the market for Japanese art was going very high. Chinese art was still not really acknowledged on the broader market or well known. And part of it was Freer's business instincts and ability to acquire things um, that he saw the opportunity in China to purchase uh, just from a practical standpoint. I mean, he was wealthy, but he was not super, super wealthy. So he did have to be judicious in how he spent his funds. But I think what is extraordinary about him is how he leapt so far beyond what was typically collected by Americans at that time into these really extraordinary, even considered today of, as you mentioned earlier, Chinese jades and bronzes and exceptional paintings when most people were looking at ceramics and other things. Um, so that I think he also shared um, interests with other people like Agnes Meyer, who was one of the original trustees in the museum, who also was a collector and scholar of Chinese art herself uh, and others who kind of fostered that interest in him. Um, so those are just some quick, quick, broad swipes, maybe at a, at a not so good answer to your question. <laughs> well, and, and I'll just add really quickly to piggyback off of William's thoughts that, um, you know, one of the one of the really uh, wonderful ironies uh, about studying the history of Chinese art collecting in the Midwest is that the Midwest is a wonderful place uh, to see uh, some of the best examples of Chinese art uh, in the United States. And, you know, Catherine would be able to speak to this much more than I could. But if you go to Cleveland, if you go to Cincinnati, if you go to St. Louis, if you go, you know, all of these cities, Toledo, even, you know, Detroit, um, what ended up happening in part as, as you know, William is, is talking uh, about is that uh, because of the, the sort of trendiness of certain kinds of art, uh, you know, like porcelains on the coast, especially in places like Boston and New York, um, other uh, art categories were devalued um, and so were therefore more competitively priced, let's say, uh, for someone you know, with, with Freer's taste and his eye and his financial resources. Um, and as it turns out, you know, they made wonderful, smart investments that, you know, where, where we can now go to Kansas City to the Nelson Atkins and see some of the best pieces uh, of Chinese art, you know, around the world uh, because they were not seen as very valuable at that time. And it just, again, speaks to the, the, the sort of evolving way that we understand what is and is not quote unquote valuable, what is and is not art. And that's a, a large amount uh, of what I uh, enjoy studying about this period is the way that these kinds of lines get drawn and redrawn uh, and evolve over time. Those are really great points. And, um, you know, as you said, a lot of truly spectacular um, East Asian art collections can be found in lots of Midwest museums, all the ones you mentioned, Art Institute of Chicago as well. Um, but those museums, I believe, all really built up their Asian art collections after Freer's lifetime. So, you know, once again, he's, um, it, it shows how much he was on the cutting edge. And, um, you know, every day I wish he had given some of his Asian art collections to the Detroit <laughs> Institute of Arts, um, but I know, there was some, um, uh, you know, disagreements with Stearns and um, and Freer had other other ideas, uh, which which DC and the whole country benefit from. Right. Um, right. 
So there is um, a question from Anne Lynn. Uh, she says, thank you. And she thanks uh, William for mentioning the U of M Lieberthal Rodel Center for Chinese Studies. Um, and she says that her question is that there are many famous Chinese paintings and sculptures in the West that were created by destroying temples or monuments in China, such as those taken from the Dunhuang caves. Do you know if uh, Freer's collections included any of those problematic art pieces. And then Elizabeth Eder followed up with an extremely helpful link um, to the, um, the National Museum of Asian Art, AKA Freer Gallery of Art and Sackler Gallery's provenance um, website. There's a whole um, series of programs that they have been co-organizing called Hidden Networks that explores provenance in Asian art. Um, I know that their collections website also has a really robust discussion of provenance. Um, so that's just for everybody's information, but I don't know if you want to respond uh, to Anne's specific question as well. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I have a couple of things that I would share. I think one is that, you know, when we think about the Western art historians, archaeologists, uh, and collectors who are generally sort of tagged as the biggest offenders, Freer's name actually doesn't come to mind, uh, which is, uh, I think, something to note. Uh, you know, he was not somebody like Langdon Warner, who was kind of climbing up on, you know, cave walls, you know, pasting glue onto, you know, murals in order to take them down. Um, and so, um, and in fact, you know, in the 19 teens, you know, in, in other parts of my book, I write about his involvement in projects to sort of think about the preservation um, of Chinese art in China. So, so to investigate, for example, the possibility uh, of starting a school of archaeology um, that would train uh, Chinese experts to be able to care for and preserve uh, different artifacts uh, and artworks uh, in, in China. Um, and so he, he uh, you know, was involved and thoughtful about, I think, a lot of these issues. Um, that said, I think, you know, it's hard to divorce, you know, an individual from a general time period where, um, and, and this is something that, you know, Chinese historians themselves have done more writing on this. Uh, there's a, a book um, called The Compensation of Plunder by Justin Jacobs, a Chinese historian who writes about the way that um, many Chinese people were involved in the extraction of uh artifacts, antiquities, and artworks from China, because at the time they had not yet developed a sense of these objects and artworks as national patrimony, as cultural kind of heritage. Uh, and they were in fact considered, you know, very uh, fungible uh, in terms of different kinds of resources that, you know, they could be traded for, whether it was political capital or financial capital or social capital. Um, and so I think that's part of a larger conversation about the ways that, um, you know, collecting during this period was a complicated thing. There are no angels and demons. Everybody's somewhere in between. Uh, and you know, some of the folks who are helping to extract some of these artworks uh, out of China um, are themselves Chinese, again, because they don't have yet this kind of dominant ideology uh, of arts and artifacts as national heritage that needs to be safeguarded. And that doesn't really come along uh, until the 1930s, a couple of decades uh, after Freer's uh, time. So, um, you know, I, I hope that maybe clarifies. It's a tricky question and one that, uh, especially I think museum curators uh, are, are um, sensitive to answering uh, for understandable reasons. Uh, and and uh, so I, I hope that I've handled it in a way that is uh, uh, careful and thoughtful. And there's an increasing interest in, in the provenance of our collections among curators across the world um, as the, the National Museum of Asian Arts uh, commitment to researching provenance demonstrates and mm -hmm. we're doing it here at the DIA too. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. There are um, you know, a lot of positive comments, thanking, thanking you for the talk, thanking other people for insightful comments in the chat. Um, we have people from all over the US and across the world tonight. Um, more thank yous coming in. Are there any last questions from you, William? Any last comments you'd like to make, Ian? William? I think, I think uh, we've had a wonderful uh, time and thank you for all the research and all the effort you put into this uh, program. Um, it's really amazing. It's, it's so enriching and enlightening to know the role that uh, Freer and the Freer House and the Detroit Institute of Arts and the University of Michigan and many others played in raising awareness and appreciation of Chinese art through the Midwest. And your work is really kind of pioneering in that way and bringing us all together. So thank you so much for, for that enlightenment.
and for all the time and to everyone for having joined us this evening. And it's just a closing thank you as well to, to our wonderful friend and partner, Catherine Kasdorf and Friends of Asian Arts and Culture at the, at the DIA. Uh, and also to the U University of Michigan Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Art and the Association of Chinese Americans for joining us and co-hosting uh, Dr. Yin Shin's lecture tonight. I, I will make a reminder that uh, this has been recorded. Everyone who registered will get a, a link hopefully by early next, next week so you can enjoy it and share it again. Um, and uh, Ian, unless you have any further comments, no, thank you everyone for coming um, and, and for sharing your evening with us. And, and again, you know, please uh, visit the DIA, certainly visit the Freer House uh, and, and uh, familiarize yourself with uh, some of our, you know, less well-known aspects of the global history of Detroit. It really has been one of my great pleasures moving to Michigan uh, to get to know this city and this region. Um, and, and I am excited to be able to have been able to share a little bit of that history with you tonight. Joining the Friends of Asian as well as uh, the Freer House. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ian.